Operation Paperclip smuggled hundreds of Nazi scientists, including top SS officers on trial for war crimes, into the United States for use in America's Cold War space race. One of these Nazi Party members, Werner von Braun, was promoted to head up NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Under Operation Paperclip, some 350 German scientists and former intelligence agents were given visas and well-paying jobs. Many of these scientists had questionable pasts. Braun himself had been an active member of the Nazi Party and his colleague at NASA, Dr. Hubertus Strugold, a specialist in aviation medicine, had performed experiments on concentration camp inmates. The purpose of this massive and illegal undertaking appears to have been for the establishment of a worldwide authority on all things relating to space and astronomy. NASA became the public face of space. It has long acted as a front providing an unsuspecting world with pseudoscience legitimized by the backing of the U.S. government. NASA is its own monopoly. It controls the dissemination of public information on astronomy while hiding facts it does not want the public to know. While many countries and universities have observatories, Always it is the statements, photographs, and discoveries of NASA that make the news headlines. So let's take a look at this Werner von Braun, the Nazi rocket scientist who was, who was performing many experiments on the Jews and the Holocaust victims and in the concentration camps and a lot of the experiments were you know killed many during these experiments of the Nazis and so this von Braun was involved in this stuff um, according to my research he was involved in a lot of the torture of the victims and so He ended up working for NASA as a rocket scientist. Any type of, I mean, they when Admiral Byrd discovered the firmament, just not too, pretty much right around the same time that Nazi was you know, formed, or that uh, not Nazi, uh, around this, pretty much around the same time that NASA was formed was around the time that Admiral Byrd discovered the firmament of Antarctica. And so at the same time, the Antarctic Treaty was put up in order to block the edges in the same year, or around the same time, within a year or so, NASA was formed, headed by Von Braun, Werner Von Braun, the rocket scientist, so that they could beat everybody to space because it was a the government was desperate and not just america when i say government i'm talking about the illuminati government which includes many nations almost all of them pretty much so so this illuminati government had was panicked when admiral bird discovered the firmament so when they hired this Nazi guy, along and von Braun was only one of many Nazis that were hired. There were hundreds of them, close to I think this is close to a thousand, um, were recruited for to work with uh, N NASA. Um, some say anywhere from three fifty to a thousand, so somewhere in between there. But many of them were Nazis, and Von Braun was one of them, and he was the rocket guy. Because how can you get a picture of space without a rocket? So you have to have a plausible illusion that you are indeed going in, into space, so that the masses, so the 
the public will believe that we went to space. So they went ahead with the moon thing and um, they gave you a picture on the last trip back or on the last trip, Apollo 17, they finally gave you a full sunlit picture of the Earth and it was this globe picture and that was the only picture you got for 43 years and without the rocket that Von Braun invented there would have been no picture there would be no valid reason for there to be a picture of the earth because no one had went that far up so the rocket was a big part of this conspiracy to hide the flat earth from the public so they got the rocket guy Von Braun and created some decent rockets that could get high enough to create the illusion that they went into outer space if you do research on a flat earth, we're saying that these rockets aren't going into space. I believe the rockets are basically used as scrap metal. So NASA, you know, they used to dump the rockets right into the oceans. That's probably what they still do. Or they can use Antarctica and basically melt the evidence and build new rockets recycle recycling metals and let's take a look at his grave van braun what does this say here so he was born in 1912 and he died in 1977 and he left a bible passage on his tombstone and that passage is psalms 19 1. well let's have a look at what that says and if you look at a Bible with a good translation method, it'll say, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. The firmament is the key word. This is what he left. This is what Von Braun, the rocket man, left on his tombstone. It's like a message from the grave, I suppose, because the word firmament comes up. So Now, some translations try to erase the word firmament and use a more modern word like sky. But in the original Hebrew, you know, in the original translations from the Hebrews, the word should be firmament. And firmament is this unbreakable dome. The dome of the flat earth well that's a pretty strange bible passage for von braun to leave on his tombstone did you get a chance uh to were, when things were being passed around the internet to look at Werner von braun's headstone over the last month yes yeah uh, where uh it, it, yeah yeah where it had you know Werner von braun for people that you have missed history uh, was you know he predates NASA not only you know he was one of the founding members and instrumental in creating NASA but he uh, you know he worked for the the Nazi war machine back in World War II and his headstone is is remarkably small there's not much to it it's not like a, a picture of him holding a rocket looking at the sky or anything like that it, in fact there's very little cement it's just a, a really humble headstone but on it is a single Bible verse Psalm 19:1 which I thought was very interesting because it's the Psalm 19 one is, depending on what Bible you look, I'm going to use the King James, says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And I thought that was very interesting uh, because one, uh, this is coming from a scientist. Yeah, you know, there's some scientists that go to church, of course. Uh, I, I thought that was very telling. You got any, uh, you got any comment on that? Yeah, I, I have heard different stories about him later in life kind of changing his ways and, you know, supposedly giving his life to God and um, spilling the beans on some things. And uh, he had that uh, interview with, uh, I forget her name, something Ross or something like that. I, I, Dr. Carolyn Rosin. That's it. 
That's the one. Carol, was, Carolyn Roslin. Yeah, that uh, talked about the um, her uh, interview or whatever she had final words with uh, Von Braun before he died. She was like a personal secretary to him, or something, and supposedly he he laid out the whole plan that the global elite are trying to do. When I was a corporate manager of Fairchild Industries in 1974 through 77, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played, that game being the effort to weaponize space, to control the earth from space and space itself. Von Braun had a history of working with weapon systems and had uh, escaped from Pinamunda to come to this country and landed as vice president of Fairchild Industries when I had met him. Von Braun's purpose in life during the last years of his life, his dying years, was to educate the public and decision makers about why space-based weapons are dumb, dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, unworkable, undesirable idea. What was most interesting to me was a repetitive sentence that he said to me over and over again during the approximately four years that I had the opportunity of working with him, and that was the strategy that was being used to educate the public and decision makers, and the scare tactics, the spin that was being put on on a weapon system, and that was how we identify an enemy the enemy at first, he said, the enemy against whom we're going to build a space-based weapon system that he thought was a ridiculous idea, unnecessary and very dangerous, not to mention too costly, etc. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites, we were told that they were coming to get us and control us, the dirty commies, that whole story. First, the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would be needing to build space-based weapons. And the next enemy was asteroids. Now, at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card and remember, Cal, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. A lie. I think I was too naive to know at that time the seriousness of the nature of the spin that was being put on the system. And now the pieces are starting to fall into place. We're building a space-based weapon system based on a premise that is a lie, a spin. And Werner von Braun was trying to hint that to me back in the early 70s and right up until the moment when he died in 1977. The intensity with which he said that made me realize that he knew something that he was too afraid to mention. He was too afraid to talk about it. He would not tell me the details. I'm not sure that I would have absorbed them if he had told me the details or even believed him in 1974.